In this session, let's look at the need, the prospects, and the steps in globalizing Indian business. In fact, the changes we have gone through in the last five years in, in the world economy is that the world itself is moving truly towards a global economy. We have been hearing about the uh, new economic order and the need for uh, a world trading system for a number of years. But now with the signing of GATT, we are truly in a situation where there is a one market world. Even large countries like the US and powerful economies like Japan are uh, integrating themselves better with this one market world. Those countries have also felt the need for regional blocks like NAFTA or the Asia Pacific region. But even those blocks are not enough. The blocks themselves have to be integrated into one global trading system. For us in India, this has tremendous implications and it is very important that every Indian business in some way globalize itself. The pattern of globalization cannot obviously be the same. There can be a variety of different ways in which and degrees to which companies can globalize. But today, no company can think of itself as a company in a particular state like Maharashtra or Varissa or in a particular region or the western as the western or eastern region and not even as being in a particular national market like Indian because all the markets are both open to international competition and also can be sources for the international market. <coughs> uh, historians tell us that at some time in the past India was a major trading country. <coughs> There were periods where India had as much as 30% share of the world trade. Uh, that was a time, of course, where agricultural and handicraft products were the dominant items of trade. We did not catch on early to the Industrial Revolution. Therefore, we have lost about 200 years of historical time during which uh, world manufacture and trade had grown a great deal. We also had the disadvantage of being under colonial regime during that period. <coughs> Even when we became independent, uh, we did not quite realize the importance of international trade or uh, we underestimated our ability to be partners in international trade. We went through a period of relative isolation from the world market. Uh, in order to develop indigenous core sector and manufacturing capability, we began with a high tariff wall and we have sustained it for a long time. We also got into special trading arrangements with the rupee trade with the Eastern Bloc and did not sufficiently participate in the hard currency trade areas. So our share of the global trade, which was 2% in 1950, declined to 0.4% by 1980. There is a danger that if we had not liberalized and geared ourselves to be a trading nation, this share would have kept going down. <coughs> For example, between 1946 and 1972 was one of the longest periods of growth in international trade in physical terms in peacetime. It was growing at the rate of 16% per annum, and the Indian economy did not participate uh, in this bonanza of international trade opportunities that many other countries took advantage of. In fact, many of the Asian tigers, uh, like Korea, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, laid their foundations during that period. The onset of the oil crisis 
uh, sent the advanced economies into a recession. There was a second oil crisis in 79-80. Since then, there has been an attempt at forging various kinds of regional blocks, uh, trade agreements, and also move towards an international trading system. Today, the globalization and exports are necessary uh, for the Indian economy as a whole and for each and every industry. Temporarily, for a period of time, a particular company may feel that it doesn't need to worry too much about exports because the rupee is becoming convertible. They can buy the necessary amounts of foreign exchange for importing technology, capital equipment, or intermediates. It is true that we have removed rigid, micro-level, company-wise controls on foreign exchange. But as an economy, we cannot go on importing technology, equipment, intermediates, and products without also, as a nation, uh, exporting sufficiently to be able to pay for it. Uh, India can uh, look forward and should be a debtor country for a long time. A developing country cannot be a major exporter of capital. It will continue to invite foreign equity investment as well as take foreign debt uh, within certain reasonable limits. We may also gradually see the rupee uh, depreciating by a reasonable margin so as to sustain the export competitiveness of Indian business as well as to restrain uh, inessential imports. Let's look at the various ways in which Indian businesses can globalize. The first and most uh, elementary stage would be to engage in exports. There are many Indian companies which are already very well established in exports. There are some very extreme, unusual cases where the company exports more than 50% of its output. But by and large, there are relatively few companies which export 20% or more of their turnover. It is in these companies which are doing 10% or more that there can be a significant drive for increasing the share of their exports in their total business. The fact that they're already doing 10% indicates that in their products and services, uh, India has some comparative cost advantages as well as that company has built up certain core competences and capabilities. It may be that in the past, due to the development of the domestic market itself, the company has not given sufficient importance to its export activities and has comfortably relied upon the growth of its overall business and even its market share in the domestic economy. But today, <coughs> that domestic volume and market share themselves are no longer reliable. They are certainly not guaranteed. They are under threat from new investment by Indian players in that industry, as well as by new entrants from overseas, either on their own or with Indian partners. And finally, even by direct imports of products. One of the uh, <coughs> strands of the new economic policy is for India to voluntarily bring down uh, high tariffs in various industries, not as a favor to the foreign countries which can then export their products into India, but much more in order to ensure that we don't become a high-cost economy due to unnatural levels of production, uh, protection. The reduction in tariff uh, would be to the advantage of the Indian consumer, uh, finally, through advantages to the Indian manufacturer who imports that equipment or intermediate. The uh, answer, therefore, lies in also opening an aggressive new uh, battlefront overseas, back in the home markets of those manufacturers who are likely to be eyeing the Indian market, either to set up a unit or to import their products into India. <coughs> a company can go about increasing its exports uh, in a number of ways. One is to work through distributors and agents overseas. Uh, there are various op uh, options here. Uh, uh, an agent for a whole continent, agent country-wise, or a number of agents in a particular country if that market is very large, regionalized, and also quite attractive. 
the next step would be to build the company's own regional offices, appoint its distributors, either sole distributors or distributors who also carry competitive products, spend a certain amount of money and effort in advertising and promotion in selected country and regional markets. The third step in globalizing Indian business would be to start some investment in those markets where company is already exporting a certain critical mass volume which justifies a local manufacturing facility. There are a variety of ways in which this manufacturing facility can be set up. If the company does not want to uh, invest capital and run uh, the currency and other kinds of risks, it can license someone locally to manufacture the product and collect the royalty fees uh, on the volume over a period of time. But in this process, it is giving away some part of the value addition and profit to the licensee. And the second option is to set up a manufacturing facility with a local partner who may share part of the equity risk as well as participate in the management of the joint venture. And this is a, uh, a middle path whereby the company can balance its risks as well as be directly involved in the manufacturing and marketing. And the third process would be to set up an exclusive uh, manufacturing facility of its own, either own 100% or own a majority or a sufficient controlling interest by the Indian company and the balance sold, uh, equity shares sold to the public in that country. <coughs> there are a few Indian companies which are beginning uh, to move along uh, this uh, product life cycle for globalizing themselves. Uh, there are well-known cases where uh, the companies have been exporting their own branded products from India to overseas markets or have been manufacturing in India for a private brand label of the foreign importer who is selling that product. Uh, some of the industries which are already significant exporters from India are the engineering industry, chemical industry, uh, the gems, uh, uh, apparel, uh, textiles, within textiles, fabrics, yarn, uh, auto components within the engineering industry as a significant exporter. Now, in these cases, <coughs> the company can set up uh, either manufacturing facility in its own existing premises or can set up a specially export-oriented unit. Uh, today, there are specialized zones uh, which have been created uh, called the export processing zones. Uh, in the electronics industry, the government has now encouraged the setting up of uh, hardware technology parks and software uh, technology parks. Many state governments are inviting Indian and foreign capital to come and invest uh, in their uh, state in these special export-oriented zones. The uh, <coughs> uh, investment can be uh, based upon technology, designs, which are not necessarily sold in the Indian market, but which have been specially adapted or developed uh, to the export markets. The ultimate stage of globalization of Indian business is to not even uh, be caught up in this dichotomy that we have had for a long time of looking at the domestic market as the first market and uh, exports as the secondary market. Uh, that really means, if we look at it carefully, that we are giving a great deal of importance to a single country market and not enough importance to the rest of the world which consists of over a hundred countries, many of which are much larger, more prosperous and constitute a much higher level of demand. Uh, even though that country happens to be India where we have begun the business and where we are nationals, and uh, emotionally we are attached to the uh, growth and development of that country, even in terms of India's own interest, uh, this kind of uh, stance uh, is not the most efficient way to look at it. Even to serve India better, uh, to put Indian resources to work, it will be useful for more and more Indian companies to see themselves 
being in the global market in the first instance and in India in secondarily as part of that global market. This does not mean <coughs> that we deliberately ignore, forego opportunities in the Indian market. We do not starve this market of the necessary capacity, commitment of resources, investments and people. We do not ignore local competition. We will continue to ensure that our opportunities in the Indian market are also taken care of. But we will make sure that our overall resource generation, mobilization, as well as allocation is done on a global optimization basis, under which there will be a regional optimization as the next level and within which there would be a country optimization as the third level of the globalization strategy. One way in which some companies are trying to do this is to first restructure themselves organizationally and change the mindset and culture within the organization. <coughs> now, uh, this kind of a global restructuring can be better done by a company which already has done several years of exports, is present in several continents, has had either agents, representatives, or small assembly plants uh, in those uh, countries, and therefore has some prior knowledge and awareness of the kind of potential and requirements in different continents and countries. For such a company, a model structure may be as follows. <coughs> it can divide the world into four, five, or six regions as appropriate. There can be no hard and fast rule as to how many regions one chooses. To begin with, it depends upon the potential and the resource availability to reach that market. Let us take the idea of a six-region world. These could be uh, the positioning of a regional director in North America, South America, Europe, Africa, West Asia, and East Asia. Uh, therefore, the world is, uh, in this process, looked at in much more depth with each regional director and his team focusing his attention on that particular region. This does not mean that we have to have immediately a very large manufacturing capacity or many locations in each of these regions. The idea is to assess the market and within that identify particular segments, particular product lines with which we can begin. And they can be used as platforms in successive stages to grow and become larger and larger in that region. Also, these regional organizations <coughs> will be very useful sources of feedback and guidance to the uh, staff functions and the manufacturing operations in India where the company happens to have been historically based. Now let's take the case of any one uh, regional director's office. Let us suppose that there is a regional director based in London. He may either be looking after only the whole of Europe if it is a six regional organization or he may have to look after the whole of Europe and another additional territory, a large one such as Africa, if it is a four regional organization. Um, similarly, the regional director, let's say based in New York, may look after only North America, consisting of the US, Canada, and today Mexico, uh, if it was a six regional organization, or he may look after the whole of the Western Hemisphere, including North, Central, and South America, if we have a four regional organization. The decision of the London-based regional director is to look at those seven or eight countries where the company may be already present, either through distribution and marketing its exported products from India, or a few countries in which it may be having manufacturing operations. The regional director and the country managers form a team which together have to look at uh, two major issues. <coughs> How do they expand the business of the company in all those countries where they're already present? And secondly, which other new countries in that region where the company is not already present, either in terms of its marketing or manufacturing, and 
which of those countries would they like to prioritize for entry in the next three to five years. Therefore, one can look at the possibility at some point of each region operating as a company within the larger India-based global company and looking at the vision, the strategies, and the directions of investment and trade for the respective uh, regions. Setting up manufacturing overseas can also be done in stages. If you take the pharmaceutical industry, for example, the first stage would be to send the bulk drugs from India and do the formulations overseas. Uh, in that process, uh, much more uh, detailed, specific, labor-intensive work can be done overseas. The freight can be saved as well as the cost advantages of making bulk drugs on a larger scale in India can be retained by the uh, global company based in India. Also, the lower technology operations, procurement of packing materials overseas, dispatch from that formulation plant to the market can be handled more easily. If that local market is growing, either within a country or in a region, there will come a time when it would be economical to put up a bulk chemical, uh, bulk drugs plant in that region. Obviously, one would not need to put up such a plant in uh, say every country. Even one location for that region may be quite enough. For example, if the market uh, demand for our products uh, in Africa and Europe was growing, an investment in some company uh, country within the EC uh, where one enjoys the tariff advantages of being within the EC as well as high level of skills uh, is very useful. Uh, similarly, there can be uh, a plant dedicated to a large market like China, uh, beginning with bulk drugs and then going into formulations in maybe more than one location. There could be a plant in Canada which would look after the North American interests. There are many other possibilities down the line. One may even do some part of the research and development overseas, either on our own funding or as a strategic alliance with another partner in the industry. Uh, there could come a stage where products, bulk uh, chemicals made overseas, can be re-exported in some categories, even to the Indian market, to be formulated further uh, into finished products. A company can learn a great deal in its globalization process in terms of technology, uh, materials, uh, packaging, uh, as well as the uh, R&D aspects of the business. The initial idea in every company which goes multinational is that the headquarters has a great deal of knowledge, skills, and experience to offer, and the region and country operations must be guided and follow the headquarters lead. But as the company globalizes and matures in its globalization, there will come a time when each region, each country, each plant may have some lessons to offer to the home country operations. The regionalization and country management uh, would lead to a position where the Indian operation becomes one of eight or ten countries operating under a South uh, and West Asian uh, regional director. The regionalization has tremendous implications for change in the mindset, culture, styles and behavior of people in the corporate office. The chairman, uh, presidents, vice presidents of this company, which is globalizing, need to detach themselves from being the top management of an Indian company to being the top management of a global company, of an emerging multinational company. The heads of the manufacturing, R&D, finance, personnel, and technical services need to look at the needs of the entire world. Uh, this is not easy uh, because they are intimately familiar with the Indian plants, Indian regional and branch marketing operations, Indian vendors. Uh, it is very likely that they will keep getting drawn into the local problems, issues for guidance, and because of their familiarity. They need to make an extra effort to distance themselves up to a uh, point uh, ensuring that there is enough development, 
delegation and capability within the India country management team. They should also start traveling, visit the regions, visit the important countries, major dealers, visit the plants, and get acquainted with the differences in the environment, technological, business, socio-cultural, and understand the special needs of each region and within that the country management. Also, so far we have been talking about the opportunities for Indian companies in their end product markets in the global uh, situation. There is another dimension to globalization of Indian companies, and that is the opportunity that they have in the factor markets around the world. As you know, uh, business runs uh, on the base of a number of factors of production. These are well known in economics. It used to be called land, labor, capital, to which today we have to add management. And because of liberalization and the reduction uh, in tariff barriers, as well as the convertibility of the rupee, every Indian company now needs to develop and improve its procurement function. Very broadly, in Indian companies, we had earlier a strong production orientation, then accounting, some degree of interest in personnel management. More recently, marketing has developed, but the procurement function is still not adequately recognized and structured and given the importance that it deserves. Uh, considering that 60% or more of the cost of the product is materials, as well as there is a high cost involved in the capital, plant and machinery and spares, the procurement function, which is the symmetrical opposite of the marketing function, can save considerable amounts and contribute to the overall profitability. So today, an Indian company, even if it is not a very large exporter, <coughs> even if it doesn't go to a world regional organization, can still access the global market for much better technology, capital equipment, intermediates, raw materials, in order to lower its cost of manufacture. By doing so, <coughs> it will not do, be doing a, any damage to the Indian economy. It will produce its goods and services at a higher level of efficiency, quality, and better productivity so that the consumers of those products, whether household consumers or industrial consumers, will benefit. If the Indian company did not do this kind of global procurement, it does not mean that uh, those products, technologies, equipment will not come in. They will come in anyway through a competitor, through a foreign investor, either directly or through a joint venture. Therefore, it is better that the current Indian producer of those end products and services himself goes out into the global market and does this procurement. I hope uh, these points have been of interest to you and will trigger actions in your company if you are in a senior management level or start a debate in this direction if you are at a middle or a junior level. Thank you very much for your attention.